of Christ members and friends. I'm Monica Argetzinger, and I'm the pastor of the Denver Congregation. We're glad that you're here with us today. We continue to pray for all those in our online community that you and your families will remain well and safe. Our service will not have a typical sermon today. My brother-in-law, Rick, who was scheduled to bring our message, tested positive for COVID last week. He's improving, but please keep him in your prayers while he continues to quarantine at home. Today, our theme is a sign of times to come. It is also Racial Justice Day. As we join in worship together, we will be challenged to reflect upon and examine our understandings as well as our actions so that we can respond in ways that reflect the love of Jesus Christ. This month, we're focusing on resurrection, one of the six principles of the doctrine of Christ that is found in the sixth chapter of Hebrew. We invite you to participate in spiritual practice that encourages us to engage on a personal level with this scripture referring to resurrection, new life in Christ. The spiritual practice, dwelling in the word, will give you opportunity to listen and respond to the scripture from Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. I will read the scripture passage three times. Each time I will ask a question and allow you some time to contemplate the scripture's meaning to you. The first question, what word, phrase, or image captures your attention? From Luke 17. Once, on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, The coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, Here it is, or There it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. Second question, what is God's invitation to you in this text? From Luke 17. Once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, The coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, Here it is, or There it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. And the third question, what do you think this scripture means in your life? From Luke 17, once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. Our invocation today was written by Caleb and Tiffany Bryan. Would you pray with me? Author of Shalom, we do not feel ready, though we yearn for peace here and now. It may not seem like it's our time, and yet we know that you provide. You have revealed your greatness to us, and now it is time for us to be mirrors of your peace in the world reflecting hope in the desolate places, shining peace in lonely corners. There are so many divisions in our world, divisions that make peace seem like a dream. We remember today that you love each and every person in this world, the young and old, the wealthy and poor, the free and captive, the kind-hearted and cruel, and every person between. Just as you love us all, you also have hopes for peace for us all. 
You can make this dream a reality. You who can turn water to wine. You who can turn the forsaken into the delighted. You who is peace. You are with us. May we be mirrors of your peace. In the name of Jesus, the worker of miracles, amen. Today in our prayers, we remember the people of Belgium, a nation in Western Europe. Belgium shares borders with France, Germany, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. Our prayer today was written by Alice Haggis. Would you pray with us? God of the universe and parent of us all, create within us the desire for peace. Give us discernment to find avenues of common ground where ad adversaries may acknowledge each other as children of God. Grant us wisdom to distinguish compromise of cherished personal ideas from the compromise of your holy principles. We acknowledge you to be perfect peace. Help us to become more like you and to share your qualities of peace with those about us. May our inner peace be the catalyst that brings us to bold action which will not diminish or cease until your purposes come to fruition. Our prayer is offered in the name of the Prince of Peace. Amen. For this part of our worship, we're going to explore the theme, A Sign of Things to Come, in a little different way. We will share with you in more of a conversation and invite you to join in that conversation with your comments and we would love to see those comments in the description below. Our scripture today is about the wedding at Cana. As you listen to the scripture, think about the questions you would have for Jesus. This is the second chapter of John, verses 1 through 11. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now, Standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water, that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests had become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed him. A sign of things to come. This is Jesus' first public miracle. His disciples witnessed the miracle. Were they surprised? Perhaps. Were they confused? Perhaps. What valuable lessons do we learn from the wedding at Cana? Have the heart of Mary. Be available for others in their tough and difficult times. Obey the will of God in, and have faith. It is for us to put our faith in God's word. The disciples 
learned this early. Do not boast and give God the glory that is God's. It is not for us to publicize our works, but to be humble in all things. At the wedding at Cana was a sign, especially for his disciples, of the wonder of God's message to the world. It is also a time to think, reflect, and meditate on God's message through Jesus' ministry. Let us today look at the ways we have, over the years in our lives, experienced and responded to God's presence in our lives. We're going to take some time to look at signs of life for us and how they have aided in our faith and commitment to become a disciple of Christ. So we've chosen several time periods to help us focus. First is eight years old and under, then under 18, uh, under 28, under 48, and finally under 68. Now, some of you have been blessed with years beyond 68, so you may have something to share for each of these periods, while some of you may have not reached a particular time period, but everyone is encouraged to share in the comments any signs of life that has strengthened your faith and commitment. So Monica and I will be sharing some personal things from our own lives, and hopefully that stimulates some thoughts uh, of, of, and reflections of your own experiences, and we hope that you can share. And I realize that the comment section is tough to, to write in, so you can be brief, but even just a short phrase can uh, be encouraging to those of us as we sh 
as we read and, and reflect on your personal sharing. So I'm going to begin with the, the first time period, uh, uh, under eight years of age. So what we're thinking about is some important things that uh, might have occurred in your life at that age. Maybe where you lived, maybe some travel that you uh, were able to do. Maybe your best friend or a pet's name. Could be a favorite song or, or maybe even a favorite subject you had in school. So as I reflect on those first years, and obviously I don't remember much before I was probably five years old, um, the things that stand out in my mind all had to do with experiences I had with the sacraments, the ordinances of the church. Now, when I was young, I was pretty sick. I had asthma, a lot of allergy problems, and I was in the hospital a number of times with pneumonia. So I recall very specifically some experiences with the laying on of hands, uh, administration to the sick. And so as a young kid, I can still remember the elders coming to our home and uh, laying, <coughs> laying their hands on my head. The next uh, experience would have been the, my baptism, which was at the age of eight. And I uh, was baptized by my father. <clears throat> and uh, confirmed by my father and my grandfather. So those are powerful moments, as you can see, as a kid that young. Monica? So looking at the time period up until 18 years old, I attended a parochial school, a Catholic school, as a child and was there through the fifth grade. So uh, that it helped me learn a lot about the Catholic faith, but it was not until I got out of the Catholic Church and began to uh, explore other faiths that I began to learn what it was like to be a Christian in God's world. One thing that was really uh, significant and continued through my whole time period from eight to 18 was my experience with the Girl Scouts. And I spent a lot of time um, in service to others, in emergency preparedness, in um, just thinking about my role in the world um, as a young person. Um, I remember the year that I graduated from high school, I asked my parents for a Bible for Christmas. Um, there was one Catholic Bible in our home, and I wanted to have my own when I went off to college. And so I asked for a specific Bible. It was The Way at the time. And um, I got that for Christmas, and as I began to read and study that, I began to grow in my Christian faith. So, as I look at uh, the next time period, which is 18 to 28, uh, of course, for most of us, that's, that's pretty significant. High school graduation, obviously, and then some folks going uh, to college, uh, others going right to work, some into the service. Um, for me, uh, going to school was, was the, the most single most important thing that I did um, as it prepared me to be a teacher. And I ended up uh, graduating with a degree in music education and taught for 32 years. Um, but as I reflect on those, those years at college, again, some powerful moments. Uh, as we, uh, in our college age group, we had a pretty good sized group of college students that were attending the Greeley, Colorado congregation. And we had classes that we did, uh, shared together. Uh, we did some retreats and had a number of wonderful experiences that really helped strengthen my faith. And you know, as a 19, 20, 21 year old, um, those those are moments when it's easy to, to kind of drift away, but those moments with that college group uh, prepared me for when I finally did graduate and go out to teach, and that's when I began my teaching career. And then, uh, fortunately, as a result of my teaching career, I was able to meet Monica and get married and have our family. So uh, that, that 18 to 28 time period was powerful because it continued to connect me to God's Spirit and can 
continue to urge me on to continue to work, to study, to pray, and to seek out uh, God's Spirit in all of the decisions that I was making. And, and those were pretty significant for me as a, as a young person trying to, trying to establish himself, whether it was in college or teaching, either whatever the case may be. So important moments as I reflect on those, those early years. So 28 to 48 is kind of a blur to me. <laughs> I was 24 when we got married. Our oldest son was born in 83, and then we had another son in 84, a daughter in 86, another in 88, and our youngest son was born in 1990. I was a stay-at-home mom at the time. I did some daycare out of our home, but mainly I was home taking care of our five kids. So um, as they began to get into school, I began to have a little bit more time uh, to focus on myself and prepare myself to get back into the teaching career that I had prior to the birth of our first son. I remember sitting in church in Yuma, Colorado uh, in probably 1990. I think Jared was there as well. And uh, talking with people about what was going on in the church and uh, the future of the church, that kind of thing. And I remember telling somebody, my fear is, once my kids all get gone, I'm actually going to get to sit through a service and listen to what they have to say, and I'm not going to believe a word of it. <laughs> well, that didn't happen. Uh, the more that I had a chance to get to know more about the church and be involved with classes with people in the church, the more that I felt like this was the denomination that I'd been led to by God. Um, at 48, uh, our, we had three kids in college. One was a senior in high school, and one was a sophomore. So, uh, actually... A freshman I guess and so we were we were busy with high school things we were off to colleges to see what the kids were up to um, and we were just trying to uh, hold our own in our congregation here in Denver and help uh, with the ministry there as much as we could so we uh, come to the, the final time period that we've kind of set aside and hopefully you've been able to share some uh, some short phrases or something that are meaningful to you about your life's experience and your signs of life. So 48 to 68. Now, fortunately, I'm not 68 yet, but it's closer than I care to admit. Um, you, another period of change and transition. It, it seems like there's never a time where you're not transitioning from one stage to another. And this was a transition to retirement for me. So I was able to retire from teaching at the age of 55. I have recently been called to the office of high priest, which uh, changed my responsibilities in the church and it changed my relationships with, with those folks in the congregation and, and around the mission center and, and indeed uh, wherever I met uh, folks from the church. And I had the opportunity once I was retired to attend some conferences recently, which powerfully impacted me to reconnect with not just the, the folks in our congregation, but to reconnect with others around the church, uh, wherever they might be, and actually to make new connections. People in Tahiti and, and Europe and, and things like that you, that you don't naturally get in uh, suburban America. So. Uh, I've been blessed because of those experiences that have continued to draw me back, continue to connect me with others that are seeking and searching as I am, but at the same time connecting in a more deep and a profound way with the Spirit that guides us in so much of what we do. And I can acknowledge that, that as I look back over all those years, the Spirit has been guiding me along the path to help me make decisions, to help can keep me on the path. And as our president says, are we moving towards the peaceful, peaceful one, Jesus Christ? And I certainly hope that it, that has been my uh, testimony to others. Um, so as, as you have reflected in, on your signs of life, we can be profoundly grateful for all of those experiences. And we trust that God will continue to reveal himself so that we can respond to all of the challenges that we face. And certainly COVID is 
probably forefront in our thinking, but there are racial injustices. There, there is oppression and there is marginalization of folks. And there are things that we can be engaged in. And we invite you to explore the following statements as you think about all of the, the, the struggles and tribulations that we're going through. But explore the following statements prayerfully. And as you move forward in your life as disciple, we trust that you are indeed moving towards the peaceful one, Jesus Christ. God brings light into the world through prophetic counsel. Prophetic counsel helps us to be in relationship with the divine through powerful words of both rebuke and hope. Prophetic words of scripture can change the hearts and minds of people and bring light into the darkest of life's circumstances. Through ministries of peace, reconciliation, and healing of the Spirit, God's light is shared in the world. God's promises can be trusted. God is faithful, even when God's people are not faithful. God's steadfast love and grace endures despite our unfaithfulness. God's part of the covenant relationship with Judah is steadfast and everlasting. Judgment may come, but because of the nature of God's covenant, restoration is always possible. God calls us through the prophetic voice to live in blessed communities of joy, hope, love, and peace. Such communities care for the poor, the marginalized, and the refugee, because God passionately can, cares for them. As we focused on Racial Justice Day 
and what has happened in our life so far, here's an opportunity to put experience and new understandings into action. During the disciples' generous response, we focus on aligning our heart with God's heart. Our offerings are more than meeting budgets or funding mission. Through our offerings, we are able to tangibly express our gratitude to God, who is the giver of all. As we share our mission tithes, use this time to thank God for the many gifts received in life. Our hearts grow aligned with God's when we gratefully receive and faithfully respond by living Christ's mission. Would you bow with me as I bless our mission tithes? Revealing God, may we always be generous. You have gifted each of us with boundless grace and unending love. May our response to that love and grace be humble service to others, and may generosity be part of our nature. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for this worship service. Like our Facebook page or subscribe to our YouTube channel and share this service with your contacts. Keeping connected is so important as we continue to be isolated due to the virus. Continue to hold each other in prayer. This week, take a moment to reach out to someone you know who needs to hear the voice of a friend. The joy that you bring them will make a difference and it will bring joy to you as well. Would you join me in the benediction? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we are able to worship together today as we reflect on the scriptures shared, the hymns sang, and the prayers given, we are reminded of the work of Jesus and his example for us. Be with us this week as we carry his message to all that we meet. Let us be the model of his love to those in need. Help us lead others to his family and the peace that comes from knowing him. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our guide. Amen. Our sending forth is from Doctrine and Covenants, section 162. I'll be reading verses 3 through 6. Do not be discouraged. You have, been, have not been promised an easy path, but you have been assured that the Spirit that calls you will also accompany you. That Spirit is even now touching alive the souls of those who feel the passion of discipleship burning deeply within. Many others will respond if you are persistent in your witness and diligent in your mission to the world. Listen carefully to the many testimonies of those around the world who have been led into the fellowship of the community of Christ. The richness of cultures, the poetry of language, and the breadth of human experience permit the gospel to be seen with new eyes and grasped with freshness of spirit. That gift has been given to you. Do not fail to understand its power. It is for divine purpose that you have been that you have given the struggle as well as the joys of diversity. So must it always be in the peaceable kingdom. Do not be defined by the things that separate you, but by the things that unite you in Jesus Christ. Over and over again you have been counseled to be reconciled to seek the unity that is imperative to the building of the kingdom. Again, the Spirit counsels the church to not allow the forces of division to divert you from your witness. Listen together to one another without judgment or predisposition. Do not assume that the answers to matters of conflict have yet been perceived. There is much labor to be done. Reason together in love and the spirit of truth will prevail. From the earliest days you've been given a sacred principle that declares the inestimable worth of all persons. Do not forget. The one who created all humankind grieves at the shameful divisions within the human family. A prophetic people must work tirelessly to tear down walls of separation and to build bridges of understanding. You hold precious lives in your hands. Be gentle and gracious with one another. 
A community is no stronger than the weakest within it. Even as the one you follow reached out to those who were rejected and marginalized, so must the community that bears his name. Go in peace.